Kia ora Atero. welcome to the Daily Blog Breakfast Club, coming to you live from Verona Cafe on K Road. Today's agenda, issue one, how much of a win for civil rights is 24-hour warrantless SIS surveillance? Issue two, why is John Key still talking to Cameron Slater? And issue three today, rates Little's shadow cabinet. To dissect the issues, head of AUT Journalism, Dr Wayne Hope, and former leader of the Internet Party, Lila Hari. Good, eve, uh, good morning to you both. Uh, let's get into issue one. Wayne, cutting warrantless searches by the SIS from 48 hours down to 24 hours, it's hardly a win for Labour, is it? Oh, it's no concession whatsoever, or no change to the original bill. What we've got to do here is we've got to look at the earlier legislation from 2013, uh, the GCSB bill, the Telecommunications Interception Bill. Now, if you look at the GCSB bill, the GSB has the power um, to actually commandeer other law enforcement organisations, including the SIS. Mm. So they can do warrantless stuff anyway. Mm. So this new bill that's going through is just going to max up the amount of surveillance available. Mm. And so um, Labor's position on it is really not a position at all. It's just simply going along with the establishment. It's just going along with the process towards a surveillance state. Do they overcompensate Labour when it comes to national security issues? They're frightened of being seen as sort of woolly and soft and liberal? That's right. Um, if they uh, have any perceptions about becoming a new government, mm. they're going to be uh, complicit in the Five Eyes arrangements. A lot of these, um, the, the thinking behind this new bill is coming on from what's happening in Australia, um, with what's happening under Abbott, the, the brutal security laws there. Mm. And look, one of the problems here um, is that we haven't been given any evidence as New Zealanders that in fact um, our security levels um, are low. Mm. We haven't been given any evidence that there's lots of New Zealanders going over to fight with ISIS. Another problem I have with this bill is that how do you ascertain if someone's a bad foreign fighter? Mm. If someone goes, if an Islamic New Zealander goes over there and fights for the free Syrian army, I don't trust our guys um, not to make a mistake. Mm. What about a, an Islamicist goes over there and fights for Hezbollah? Now, they're, they're a terrorist organisation five mm. years ago, mm. according to the US and Israel, mm. but Hezbollah are fighting ISIS as well. So oh. do, do you see what I mean? Actually defining who a foreign fighter is in relation to this legislation is going to be very dodgy. Lila, the Inspector General has outed the PM's office of instigating and coordinating a smear against the leader of the opposition months out from an election using falsified SIS information. If the SIS show that much appalling judgment in 2011, how can they be trusted with warrantless surveillance? Well, they can't, and as a matter of principle, nobody should be subjected to warrantless surveillance. But I just want to take you know one little step back from this, because it seems to me that the um, Labor's concession on this is just completely capitulating to you know, the longer term agenda. Mm. In fact, Labor took a pretty hard line in 2013 on the changes to the um, legislation, the GCSB legislation. Mm. They had pledged to a comprehensive review of security laws before any further changes should be made. Yep. And so they have completely rescinded on the expectation that they created from 2013 and through the last election campaign. Now, it you know, my view would be that any party that is prepared to even consider cooperation on the government with these issues should not do so until A, the issues that were revealed by Snowden and um, Glenn Greenwald and in the moment of truth are dealt with, which mm. showed the Prime Minister was lying mm. about mass surveillance in New Zealand, and B, um, until that comprehensive review has happened. I just do not get why Labor would even go a little bit towards that and give the government a free pass mm. on what we've learnt over the last six mm. months. It makes absolutely no sense to me, and I think they could have fought hard on this and won. Of course, um, before Cunliffe became uh, leader of the Labour Party, David Shearer, of course, had made that offer to Key secretly to cut a deal over the GCSB legislation so we could get some agreement on that. Do you see this more as Labour taking a step back from being seen as too progressive on this? Uh, Grant Robertson was certainly driving a really progressive agenda mm. around mm. the time of the GCSB changes. Um, and Labor kind of had, were caught up in that um, 
the mood of you know the anti-national electorate mm. at the time mm. against the changes. I think that what happened this year as a result of the dynamics of the election campaign is that they now want to run a mile from any association with those issues. Right, right, but, right. And that might make some short-term political sense for them. Yep. Um, but in terms of the substantive issue here, which, as Wayne says, is the sort of international trend towards surveillance states, mm. it's a big mistake because now they've gone that little step yep. without having fulfilled any of the earlier requirements that they set um, they've kind of taken themselves out of this fight. And there's, a, there's another point here. Yeah. Uh, one other change to the original bill, which is supposed to improve it, yes. is the Inspector General giving more, given more oversight. Um, but the previous bills we've been talking about in 2013, the GSCS, GCSB bill and the Telecommunications Interception Bill, that undercuts the power of the Inspector General that's right, anyway. That's right, that's right. So it's actually not a real change at all. Wayne, the government say that our safeguards to this warrantless spying is the SIS will need to get a warrant if they want to reach the evidential threshold to hold it up in court. But that's only a safeguard, surely, if the intent of the SIS is to get this evidence to the legal threshold. If they're just doing it for intelligence gathering and they have no intention of it being able to get a, 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 an evidential uh, warrant, then that safeguard's meaningless, isn't it? I think the whole approach is wrong. Um, in these days of, yes, there are international terrorist groups, um, the first thing you have to do as a government is strike up good relationships with the, Islam with the Islamic communities that already exist, yep. with their moderate leaders that have got a lot of mana within their own groups. So your first priority is dialogue with Islamic peoples in your own country, right? Yep. Now, these kinds of draconian legislation and the kinds of surveillance that's happening is actually um, are creating um, a lot of resistance, a lot of anxiety among Islamic people. And so you're actually going to create the problem you're trying to solve. Because what will happen is that the moderate leaders won't be able to uh, keep control of some of the younger people mm. in their mm. in their groups mm. um, who are really, really irritated by this. Mm. And then it's just a vicious circle. So my answer to this is that the surveillance approach to it itself is wrong. You've got to have dialogue with the leaders of the Muslim communities themselves. Lila, opposition parties are claiming they have removed the SIS from using warrantless spying for commercial and economic interests. But if a commercial or economic interest suggested the actions against them amount to terrorism, is that safeguard worth anything? I just, it, to me, it's kind of an angels on the head of a pin mm. argument. Mm. I don't think these safeguards are worth anything until we have gone back to the fundamentals of the role of our intelligence services their links with the international intelligence community and the purpose of running security gathering operations mm. and mm. to the extent of those. Um, so, you know, as soon as we get into trying to unpick the minutiae of these changes, we play that game of avoiding the bigger question, you know, here. So, so that, that we, I mean, the left generally had had a pretty strong consensus on mm. in 2013 that mm. there needed to be a first principles review of these agencies and these relationships. Well, under these guidelines, couldn't the coal industry make the case to the SIS that Greenpeace are going to do a protest on one of their ships, that's going to cost them a huge amount of money, this is eco-terrorism, and we need oh, to know what they're doing. I mean, do, uh, don't we do. open I mean, this up the, to that? The definition of terrorism would enable a whole lot beyond, you know, the, oh, yeah. the Islamic State Nothing to do with the Islamic State, right? To yeah. be yeah, it's called, um, it's interrogated. It's called function creep. Yeah. The ostensible reason for introducing this kind of legislation uh, becomes expanded. But I've got another view on this too. If we go back to the great financial crash and the huge recessions around the world that it mm. caused and a lot of revolt and resistance in different countries, if we have another crash and the depression afterwards is even worse, yeah, I think that a lot of this legislation, especially in the United States, is, is designed to uh, keep an eye on mass revolt further down the track, if yeah. it does happen. Final question of both of you. Have either Labour or National provided one real justification as to why we have to go through this erosion of our civil liberties? Uh, no. Well, the best that National's been able to come up to, with is an increase in the domestic terror threat from very low to mm. low. Mm. Um, and 
The fact is that you would never change legislation in any case based on a change in the you know, the level of threat. Mm. Um, you've got to assume that you have in place a, a, a legislative framework that is going to be adequate in relation to any level of threat. Um, and that's what the Prime Minister told us was the case in 2013, yep. um, along with his lies on yes. mass surveillance, yes. of course. Have they come up with one reason yet? Well, the problem here is that um, if there is a reason, it seems so the public's not allowed to know what it is. <laughs> It's, it's the public evidence, the public evidence that would be required to justify this legislation has not been forthcoming because it has to be a secret. Yeah. So we've got no way of knowing whether the uh, government is uh, playing fast and loose with the reality or not. Is sucking up to America a good enough explanation? Oh, it's all about five eyes in the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move on to issue two. Despite everything that has been outed in terms of do dirty politics, why are Cameron Slater and John Key still best friends forever? Uh, light of the rumour is Slater has recorded all his conversations with the Prime Minister and he has a damning recording of him. How concerning is it that a far-right hate speech blogger might have leverage over the Prime Minister of New Zealand? Well, I think the key word there is might. Hmm. And I don't think that you know we should get into the kind of conspiracy um, scenarios ourselves. Yeah. I mean, that's the specialty of people like Cameron Slater and Jason E. Yes. Um, what does seem extraordinary, though, is just the the judgment of the Prime Minister in maintaining open lines of communication with someone who has been um, shown to be so politically poisonous mm. um, to his his um, office and to his um, mana mm. and to the interests of the National Party. That's what I don't get, is, is why maintain that relationship, um, given, you know, clearly it's dangerous from a reputational point of view. Cameron Slater referred to a young King's College student who drank himself to death as a, a, a toffee-nosed little um, snob um, and, 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 and who was a thief and a liar and um, King's, student, King's College students couldn't handle their piss and that, he, that was proof for him that they were always poffs. Um, is that the kind of person the Prime Minister should be having regular discussions with? I mean, I actually read Dirty Politics, obviously, unlike most New Zealanders yes. who took their view of the book from, um, from the Prime Minister's that was comments all the on it. Spear, yep, yep. Um, and I can say hand on heart that I have never had a friendship or professional relationship with someone who communicates in that way. I found it utterly and completely extraordinary. But, you know, partway through this election campaign, the Prime Minister showed that he was prepared, you know, to use terms like sugar daddy in relation, you know, yep, to my rela yep, you know, yep, relationship yep. with Kim.com, um, that he had a kind of pretty misogynist orientation himself. Um, clearly, there's a level of comfort in those circles mm. with that kind of communication. I mean, I, I resile against it, and I, I have no way of um, connecting myself, you know, like interpreting it. It's yeah. the, I mean, the fact he's continuing now with the reputational threat is extraordinary. The fact that he ever had um, a relationship with this guy is Wayne, beyond belief. what does Key get out from continuing to have a relationship with Slater? Oh, look, I don't know. Um, as I'm really pleased you raised the question in the first instance because He's having relationships with Slater occasionally now, rather than more often. Yes, not a proactive one, not a proactive um, relationship. But what's interesting is that other people involved in the dirty politics saga, he has distanced himself from them. Right. Like, where's Jason Ede? Right. Uh, um, Warren Tucker, who's clearly been fingered as being involved in the politicisation of the SIS. Yes. The Prime Minister actually criticised the SIS under his directorship in response to the... That, that report. That's right. Um, so with other people, he's he is distancing himself, but not with Mr. Slater. Look, I don't know, but I'll tell you what. There's a real contradiction emerging here. Um, on the one hand, um, as Lila's pointed out, you've got the Prime Minister of the country associating with somebody who uses feral and misogynist language uh, on a pretty regular basis and involved in all sorts of skullduggery. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, that same person 
um, has close links with the National Party establishment. Mm. And this is going to be a contradiction which I don't think John Key can resolve for as long as he keeps even in nominal contact uh, yeah. with Cameron Slater. Who is the winner here? Uh, Judith Collins, ultimately? From... Uh, the relationship between uh, the, I don't think there is a winner. Slater. I mean, it, it, somebody is getting some personal satisfaction from this, I yeah. expect. Yeah. Um, and perhaps that's Mr. Slater's motivations. Right. Um, I don't think there are any political winners now no, from I think maintaining these relationships. Collins doesn't get anything out she of this. She seems to have distanced herself from him yes, fairly she effectively. Is, she is. The reason why Collins was um, pushed out is because National's internal polling was telling them that, that she was um, she was hemorrhaging their support. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, so yes, it was yes. a, a strictly. Um, calculative decision yeah. based on the polling numbers yeah. and um, and Nationals people, the David Farris of the world mm. um, and their market research and polling will tell them already that if they try to get Collins back into Cabinet then Nationals approval ratings um, and poll ratings are going to get damaged again so I think um, Collins is sort of permanently on the outer really. Uh, final question to both of you, uh, is it's Cameron Slater so radioactive and toxic that he might actually kill off John Key. Do something that the left isn't actually able to be able to do so far. Could it actually be Slater that kills off Key? Well, you know, if, if John Key has even more difficulties in this term, uh, has to leave before it's up or something, you know, something really apocalyptic happens, it'll be his own fault. He'll be the author of his own downfall if that's the case. I mean, I don't want to blame it on a on a blogger. Yep. Um, I mean, he's the Prime Minister and it's he that's made these big decisions about who to consort with and who to not yeah. consort with. I wasn't sent the Prime Minister's phone number, I'm surprised. Uh, Lila, <laughs> is, uh, is, could, 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 could Slater be the end of key? Um, no, I don't think so, but I do, I mean, I think we should go back to the role that that blog, blogger, Prime Minister, um, mass media relationship, mm. mainstream media relationship plays in framing political issues. Right now, um, we've got the mainstream media sort of stepping back a little from, you know, drawing on those sources yep. and yep. Um, playing with that relationship. But, you know, time could shift it back into a useful, yep. um, you know, a useful point of contact for them. Yeah. And so I wouldn't bet my bottom dollar on um, the mainstream media not starting to draw again on those relationships and I think we've got to be vigilant and understand that dynamic because you know one embarrassing expose doesn't change something that's deeply entrenched mm. in the way that our political system has been working. Our final issue today, Andrew Little has revealed his new shadow cabinet. What do the guests think? Uh, Wayne Robertson as finance and King as deputy. Smart move by Little? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, he's basically telling Grant that uh, I'm giving you a lot of responsibility and a lot of work and you have to prove yourself. Rather than giving him a, a Deputy Prime Ministership or Shadow Prime Ministership, which is more status than work. Yep. Um, and so, you know, time to plot or, or is Mr Little doing a good job? Yep. You're a powerful man now, go off and do your job. And the interesting thing about this whole Cabinet lineup is that Little's basically put everybody on notice for about a year yep. uh, to perform yep. and so he reserves the right to reshuffle it after that and if Labour improves in the polls, which I think they should because Little's performed pretty well over the last two weeks, that'll give him more gravitas within yep. the party and within the caucus and so he'll be then in a position to actually look at things again according to how people have performed. So I think it's a shrewd move to put King and Robertson there. Obviously Annette King as deputy is not going to be a long-term solution, but she's just there just to see how Labour goes. Right. Lila, with Mana uh, killed off by Labour, they don't need to appeal to the left any longer as those voters have nowhere else to go, especially with the Greens sort of galloping to the centre. This is smart politics by Labour? Well, I'm more optimistic than you are, I think, about the potential for Andrew Little to hold Labour away from the right. Yep. Um, he, you know, the one really solid um, piece of politics I know about Andrew is his commitment to the manufacturing sector yep. and therefore his um, 
critique of monetarism because the two go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. If he can, you know, hold that as a central tenet of economic policy, um, if he can ensure that Grant Robertson as finance spokesperson um, is, is committed to a non-monetarist direction far more clearly than David Parker was, yep, or yep. even Michael Cullen, yep. um, then I think that kind of liberates Labour in many ways from the sort of core, one of the core tenets of the neoliberal project. Right. Um, and so we will see the state moving into job creation much more I um, think focused on, on actually I, doing that? I certainly hope so. And I hope, you know, Labour will look at some of the innovations that, for instance, we presented at, with MANA yeah. um, in, the, in the 2014 election campaign, because there's actually a lot of resource available in the public sector for active intervention to create full employment, right. both in the terms of sustainable long-term good jobs, yep. but also that transitional work creation that has to happen to alleviate extreme deprivation, particularly in Māori communities. I mean, and I think, you know, this, the Carmel Sepuloni um, in social development, working alongside um, Grant Robertson yep. in finance, with Andrew Little's sort of commitment to a strong focus on employment, um, we, you know, I'm pretty optimistic that we could see some pretty cool stuff on the job creation front, and I think that would be a huge contribution to um, popular success for them as well. Final question to both of you: Has Little impressed to date as leader? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I guess the best thing about him is that he can speak in Kiwi idiom, and, yep. he, and he's yeah. quite a visceral um, politician. So when the Prime Minister was um, dancing on a pin in Parliament um, and Little said, cut the crap, I mean, that's a Kiwiism, mm. and people can relate to that. Yeah. I want to make one more point about the Cabinet reshuffle. It's not just about the ranking of the politicians, it's also about the ranking of the portfolios. And one thing that disappoints me is um, how there's nobody holding broadcasting and ICT near the top of that list, or even in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, put yeah. Claire Curran to one side, I'm worried about the low priority given to that portfolio. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, we need TVNZ7 back, we need a vibrant public broadcasting system, we need public service values to move into the online blogosphere. We Minister and Culture and Heritage need to look at the whole communications sector in terms of regulation and overall coordination. And that whole thing, um, Labor's not taking it up, and it's disappointing. Your uh, uh, first week, first couple of weeks of, uh, of Little as a Leader, impressed? Yeah, I am, and I think that he'll, he, you know, he's at, there at the right time. I mean, there's been a lot of commentary over the last couple of weeks about how he's got a, you know, he's had a lucky break with yep. all the stuff yep. going down with the government and yep. so on. Actually, that's crap. The, um, there were plenty of breaks that yes. former Labour leaders over the last few years had with the GCSB stuff, with the Sky City Dirty Deal, yep. all of that. It's the mainstream media who have now decided to give a Labour leader a chance. Right. And I think, you know, he, he's going to run with that. Um, I think that, you know, the, the fact he lied to the media last week mm. um, is going to be very, very helpful mm. um, to Labour's relationship with the media mm -hmm. um, because there'll be an utu factor there. Right. And, um, and, yeah, I just feel quite optimistic about their potential to sustain their momentum. Let's wrap with a final word, Wayne, your final word today. Yes. Um, remember the last election? Yeah. Um, a large win for the National Party. And they must have thought that with that victory, they would have put, put the whole dirty politics and broglio to bed. Mm. But like a zombie movie, it keeps coming out. So um, for the Daily Blog's point of view, it's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Lila, your final word? Um, well, over the next week, I'll be stepping out of the leadership of the Internet Party. Yep. Um, and leaving it to those within the party who want to sort of continue as an electoral party um, to do that. Personally, um, I think that it's a flogging a dead horse electorally, um, and that um, and that we need to sort of look beyond um, this particular sort of attempt to um, bring a new kind of politics into Parliament. Um, for a new opportunity to do that. And um, my thinking really is that Labour 
um, need to start looking at some of those issues around the digital economy, internet freedom. Unfortunately, they've done a big cock up with the spying stuff to start with, but maybe that's <laughs> retrievable um, because the growth of Labor as a substantial counter to national, I think, is essential culturally, you know, electorally, for us to get a change of government next time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My final word uh, only in New Zealand could the Prime Minister's office get caught putting out falsified secret intelligence service information months before an election to smear the leader of the opposition and the response by New Zealanders is meh. We are so laid back, even our fascism is casual. We crucified Helen Clark for signing a painting that she didn't paint. Here you have the Prime Minister's office working hand in glove with the intelligence apparatus to smear the leader of the opposition. Yeah, only in New Zealand. See you next week.